Come on. Rest upon your feet. Clap your hands. Shout a shout of praise as we welcome Dr. Yunisa Dubango. Give it up, give it up, give it up for Dr. Yunis. Thank you, thank you. You can have your seats. I hope your afternoon is good. Mine is. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm really thankful to the leaders in this ministry for always calling me to share with the people that are under your care. I know there are so many ladies in this ministry that you could choose from. So that you continually reach out to me, I'm very grateful. May the Lord richly, richly bless you. Yes, uh, my name is Eunice Adubango. I hope that uh, from the last time I was here, some of you that didn't know how to pronounce my name now know. I hope you're, 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 you're not saying Adubango. <laughs> but like I usually say, I have the grace to forgive everyone because I learned to pronounce my name six years into the marriage. So <laughs> I, I, I really have enough grace for people who say Adubango. And, and, and for that matter, many times I go to places and I would say I'm Eunice Adubango, you know, so that we can move on. I'm a mother now of three boys. Um, God has called me to raise a generation of men after his own heart. My mother raised girls and I'm raising boys. And we will do this and we will show the world that it is possible. To have a man that is wholesome. Praise the Lord. So yes, greetings from my family, my husband, Brand Adubango, my three children, Israel, Ronel, and Kyle. They are, they are very, very excited men in my house. So this afternoon, I'm going to share from a, a someone that I have baptized cycle breakers and path blazers. I tried to do slides if, if, if they are ready, they can be up. That is what I'm going to share on. But I want us to open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 because we are going to pray and I want each one of us to pray for themselves. So I want us to go to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 and uh, if you could give me the Amplified, I would be happier. There is the Amplified, Classified, specifically. If you have it, I would be happy. Okay. By having the eyes of your heart flooded with light, so that you can know and understand the hope to which he called you, and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints. Um... I really want to read the Amplified Classic. The Amplified Classic Edition says, by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light so that you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints and in brackets his set apart ones, the New Living Translation says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. The New Century Version says, I pray also that you will have greater understanding in your heart so that you will know the hope to which he has called us and that you will know how rich and glorious are the blessings God has promised his holy people. I'll end with the amplified version that I have here. It says, and I pray that the eyes of your heart, and the amplified defines this as the eyes of your heart. The eyes of your heart is the very center and core of your being. 
So I will replace the eyes of your heart with that. I pray that the very center and core of your being will be enlightened. That it will be flooded with light by the Holy Spirit so that you will know and cherish the divine guarantee, the confident expectation to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. One of the prayers I've been praying this week that I want each one of us to pray before I start to teach is that the very center of my being will be flooded with light. You see, when light, when a floodlight is switched on, you will see everything. I'm not talking about your light bulb in your house. I'm not talking about that bulb that is full of dirt and soot and whatever, such that even when it is on, you're not sure that the light is on. I'm talking about a floodlight. Now, there are so many things that you have been taught. So many things that Pastor Florence has taught. You need the light of the Holy Spirit to cast a flood on all those scriptures that you will see. When we were little, uh, people who know me know that I haven't watched many movies. My friends usually joke that I've only watched the Jesus movie, which is fine. Now, we used to watch the Jesus movie and the Luganda version. There is that man, blind but mears. The day that he got to see in Luganda, he could not believe his eyes and he said, Katindaba. And so in my parents' house, every time something was explained and you finally got a light bulb moment, everyone would stop and say, Katindaba. Now, I want you to pray that as the word is preached, that as I teach, God will put a floodlight on everything that I will say, that you will be able to open your eyes and say, Katindaba. Are we together? Everybody, just pray. Just pray those words exactly the way they are. Pray, Lord. Say, Lord, cast a floodlight on the very center of my being this afternoon. That I will be able to see. That I will be able to understand the hope to which you have called me. That I will be able to understand my glorious inheritance because I am a saint. Lord, I thank you so much because the opening of your word gives us light. David said, your, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Lord, we have paths ahead of us. We need your light. We don't need just a little light, but we need a flood light. We need you to cast your light deep inside our hearts. Reach every shadow, reach every dark portion of the core and the center of our being that we may be able to exclaim and say, I was blind, but now I see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to read quite a number of scriptures and I'm just going to go, 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 go. I have a lot to teach. I have about 41 minutes to go. Uh, 51 minutes to go, so you're going to have to tighten your seat belt and you're going to move with me. Um, we are going to read a long portion of scripture in Hebrews 11. We are going to read from verse 1 to 40 and we are going to read it quickly. Now faith is the assurance. You can, you can do New Living Translation so that we go through it a bit faster. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old under good reputation, underline good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It was by faith that Abel brought a better and a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence 
that he was a righteous man and God showed his let me read here and God showed his approval of his gifts although Abel is long dead he still speaks to us by his example of faith it was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and he rewards those who sincerely seek him. He rewards those who sincerely and hotly pursue him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave his home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And when and, and even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child. Though she was barren and too old, she believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead, a nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. And I'm among, I'm among one of those. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called Eunice's God. For he has prepared a city for me. Hallelujah. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had, prom who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Isn't God confused? Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense... Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future of his sons, Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed down in worship as he leaned on his staff. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. He even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left it was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child like me. And they were not afraid to disobey the king's commands. Praise the Lord. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorstep so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. He even had no idea that Jesus was going to die for our sins. Wow. Let's go. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right into the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to say? 
It would take me long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, oh, Hannah, Ruth, Eunice, everyone. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, praise the Lord. They quenched the flames of fire and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life. After the resurrection, some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sold in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went ahead about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for me, so that they would not reach perfection without me. Praise the Lord. Now when I read that, it is possible for us to think that we are talking about just faith. I read those stories and I read about men and women who, because of their pursuit of God, set some trails ablaze. You know, no barren woman would start to believe that God can give a child if we had no Sarah. If we had no Hannah, there is nobody that would actually stand and say, I can pray by faith. But we have a Hannah to look to. We have a Sarah to quote. There is no one who is almost a hundred years that would believe that you can have a child. But because somebody set a path, because someone blazed the trail, we can believe. We are talking about men and women who make us believe that the mouths of lions can be shut. Because they dared to believe that the report of the Lord is better. So they said, we will not kneel down before you, O king. You can throw us in the furnace of fire. Because our God is able to deliver us. But they said, but even if he does not deliver us, they set a certain trailer blaze for some of us. We are talking about people like Ruth who showed us how to be married right. She showed us that you can live and cleave. She said, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Over the Easter season, I told my husband, I said, we have to go to Paida and the boys have to see the village. Because my village is closer, it is easier to go there. So it has been so many years and the boys haven't gone. And I told my husband, if you're good enough for me, your village is good enough for me. Now there are women sitting here and you despise the village where that man comes from. If he's good enough for you, the village is good enough for you. That is what Ruth shows us. She, she blazed that trail. She said, I will leave this place and I will go. She said, I will take a risk and take on your gods. She had no idea what she was taking on. But she showed those of us who are willing to heed how to be married. Because the Bible tells us that only those who are willing and obedient will eat the good of the land. So if you're not willing, if you're not obedient, you can see all these trails and you will not react. Are we together, people? We are talking about people like Deborah who came and judged in Israel in a time when almost nothing was able to happen. We are talking about people like Elizabeth. Oh, I love Elizabeth. She carried John the Baptist, and the Bible says John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit when he was still in the womb. I teach in the school of prayer, and I struggle with 40-year-old adults who are struggling to be filled with the Holy Spirit. How better for a woman to pray that their child is filled with the Holy Spirit from on the inside? Because we have been shown that it is possible. It is possible because someone has gone ahead of us and they have blazed that trail. They have believed. They have hoped against hope. 
We are talking about men like Enoch who never died. And they make me believe that, man, you can just walk with God and disappear. It is actually possible because somebody has done it. That is what a hot pursuit does. You set a trail. I have put in my slides and I've asked a question. And I've asked you, what cycles will you break? And what paths will you blaze? We are going to take our time and we are going to think about the cycles in our lives. We are going to think about the paths that we have taken. I will tell you about me. You know, I have a friend who keeps encouraging me. I had people who used to say, but Eunice, you really over testify. You really talk about yourself. And this friend told me, I love to listen to you because you show me that God can work in the life of a man. And so for that reason, I will still tell you about me. For the reason that you will know that God can work in the life of one who has decided that I will pursue. God will work in the life of that woman who is frail and weak, but has said, I will touch the hem of that garment. God will work in the life of that woman who has said, when God says it, I will do it. You know, until the light of God illuminates your heart and you understand that the promises of God are yes to you and amen to the glory of God, you will still be in a meeting and you will still be whining and you will still be complaining about submission. You will actually try to be in court with God. You will actually try to say, but why didn't God tell the men also? You, you will try to question God. But when you know that his word is living, it is active, it is sharper than a two-edged sword, you will do what he says. I didn't grow up in a very well-to-do family. I remember... Sometimes I tell people, and they can't believe that. I know a few of you can believe, because probably you've been through the paths I've been through, that you can actually wash with, uh, you know, sponge. Those sponges, eh? they can form lather. Hmm? When, when, it's, when, 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 those, when they are still young, when, when, before they, they mature, you can crush them and put them in water, and you can actually form lather and you can actually wash with them. Anyone knows that? I remember my mom had a friend. We were so poor, we could not afford a meal. And my mom had a friend. You know, you know poverty? I, I need to be given an opportunity one day to talk about poverty. But I, if I start to talk about poverty now, I will eat up all my time. But you see, poverty can cripple you. And poverty, you know poverty is a spirit. Poverty can attack you to an extent that even when you put in a lot of effort, you get nothing. So we were poor not because my mother was not hardworking. She was a very hardworking woman. Those that know my mother know that she's a hardworking woman. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm like that because that's how I grew up. But we would plant, we would go to the garden so early. My mother was a, head, was, a, was a teacher, and she was a head teacher in schools so far from, the, I, I don't even know if you've ever heard of the villages. I remember a school where we were called Chiseitaka Primary School. Deep in, deep inside. And in that school, many times snakes would come to the living room while we are seated. The head teacher's home. My mother would plant, but we would not get results. So she had a friend who used to steal food from her home because she was farming with her husband. She couldn't just give us. She used to steal cassava to bring to us for mommy to feed us. 
but we could not even afford salt to sprinkle on that cassava or good water to drink with that cassava. I have been poor to a point where I knew that when the head teacher came and said, we are going to send people back home and he's going to read the names, I didn't need a prophet to tell me that my name is on the list. Because as far as the heaven and earth prevail, my name would be on that list. I went to school late. I left school. I went back to school late. I went through such seasons. I have known low self-worth. I have known low self-esteem to levels that I can't even describe. That for me, even when I see someone who is suffering with that, I can just tell. I know the map of low self-esteem so well because I have been there. I was always self-guessing. Am I looking right? Did I say it right? Did I stand right? What are they thinking? I really wanted to know what you're thinking. And in most cases, I couldn't take what you're thinking. And if you were not thinking, I made up some thoughts for you. I would say, I think now they are thinking. I have been victimized. I know the pain of sick, having a sick parent. I know the pain of not being sure if your, your father is going to make it the next day. I know the pain of rejection. But there's been many turning points in my life. I remember when I was expelled from school and someone is going to say, what? Eunice Dubango was expelled from school? Yes. Over issues that were not my doing. I remember getting home and I had this belief that in order for you to be someone in this generation, you had to study in a certain school, you had to do exams with a certain people, you had to, you know, I had all those definitions. I was born again. I came to church, I shouted, I said the hallelujah, I sang in the choir, I danced, I went through the motions. I don't want to tell the whole story. But then this one time, when I left school, I was put in a school where there was no fellowship. And I started to miss the fellowship in my former school. And so I said, we will start a fellowship. And then I became a leader because no one was willing to lead. And then I realized that it came with a certain burden. I realized that there was responsibility being the leader. And then I realized that if I was going to be anything in this generation, I had to pursue God. I stayed in Mokono for a long period of my life. And the secret place that I always went to was Besania Hill. I was there. I started to do those retreats when I was in senior, senior, three, senior four, third term. I made sure every week I found time to go up the hill and hide in the cleft of the rock. Because the storm was too huge, I needed to hide somewhere until it has passed by and how I thank God for those seasons because I wouldn't be standing here today. Amen. I want us to make certain considerations on the next slide. To consider, I'm saying I want you to make considerations. And the key word is consideration. And to consider means to study to consider means to look keenly at. It means to bring a magnifying glass and look at something. To inspect, to perceive, to examine, to think about, to chew on, to meditate on. 
And I want us to think about these six. They are many, but because of time, I want us to think about these six. One, when you work and stay on your assignment, you move the course of your family lineage. The reverse is true. The success of future generations lies in balance because of your lack of diligence. Your disobedience and missteps stagnate others. It is your choice to shift the trajectory of your family's course and the destiny for generations to come. It is a choice. And yet choice alone is not enough. Because Zechariah 14, which we will read later, shows that God delights in you starting to work. But a breakout is going to cost you. A breakup is going to cost you. So you're going to make a decision in the next few minutes as I tie this in to either break out or stay the course. I know poverty to a level where I could not manage to take my child to hospital. Where I was forced to believe for healing, not because at that time I believed in healing. But it was the only choice. I know poverty to a level where I entered a fellowship. I was teaching in Makere. I wasn't on the payroll, but who knew? You are an engineer, okay? You are doing your PhD, so you're soon doctor. And everyone thinks that you have the money. Huh? The status. So I enter a cell meeting, and all I had on me was 20,000 shillings which I had earned the hard way. And then it was someone's birthday. And they said everyone needed to contribute. Okay? And I got 10,000 shillings and I contributed. And a few brethren went in the corridor. And they said, eh, engineer Ngamokodo. Omulabie. She cannot. Engineer is a miser. Have you seen her? She cannot even contribute. I was feeling like the lady who put in the pens. But my people were feeling like I was the miserly miser of the generation. I know the pain of going to visit your father. The father who took care of you, loves you. You finish school. Every, he did a graduation party, okay? So the whole village knows that they have a civil engineer in that home. And then you go to see him and you can't carry nothing. Okay? And everyone passes while you're seated with your father and say, Basa engineer tumulabye, katuja tulie kumasavu. And you've brought nothing. Actually, on the contrary, because at your parents' home there is a garden at the back, you have gone to pick something. I remember the one that broke my back that is going to bring me to the gist of my message is one day we went to church and I'm not telling this story to spite the person in this story but I thank God for this brother we went to church our fuel tank was always in red like that was its default position and that is if the car is working and that is if, if the car is working, the tires are not flat. Okay? So, we go to church. I'm a leader. I'm a minister in school of prayer. Praise the Lord. I speak in tongues. I chase demons. I pray for people. That is what I was. And then when we parked the car, when we came out of the service, hmm, you can guess what had happened. When we tried to start it, it had pulled. Eh? Quote unquote. Guess you say. And while we are there, now at this point, we have 10,000 shillings on us. And that 10,000 shillings was going to take us through the week. And we, don't have, we can't get this car out of that parking lot. So this brother came to say hello. He was putting on a white shirt. 
and I could see the 50k bills in the pocket. And so I decided to tell my story in such a way that maybe he will have mercy upon me. So I told my story. I told him how things have been bad, how the baby has been sick, how now the car. You know, at this point, my husband has walked to Chisasi huh? with a, a jerry can. I don't know if he's going to bring fuel for how much. I don't even know. I don't know what we'll eat. He's going to get some fuel. But I'm hoping this brother will take 50,000 shillings, just one note, and give it to me. And when I was done telling my story, he said, Eunice, I'm so sorry. I will pray with you. And he went. I'm very happy for that day. I am so happy for that day. Why? Because I looked back in the entire lineage of my generation and my mother, my father. And in my father's family, I could only see my father is the one who ever had a job. And he also was terminated suddenly. My mother had worked in Makere for 15 years and he, she wasn't on the payroll. She wasn't being paid. I looked back. My sisters had studied. They had master's degrees and they were seated at home. And I, I didn't need a prophet to tell me that if I didn't rise up now, Israel was going to follow like this. Ronel was going to follow like this. Whoever is on the inside of my womb was going to follow like this. And so I went home and I asked my husband, I said, can you allow me to take a season of prayer? He said, yes. I picked my bags and I camped in Seguku. It was a rainy season. I could not even afford you. Because you see, in Seguku, even if it's a prayer mountain, there are those who can afford the tents. Huh? There are those who can afford the bush. There are those who can go in the dormitory. I could not even afford the 3,000 shillings per day for a tent. So if it rained, it rained on me. If it didn't rain, I thanked God. I was there three days and three nights. And I told God, you either speak or you speak. You are going to speak one word like this. And I am going to hang on to it. And I am going to do what you say. Because things cannot go on like this. Now, that is just a portion of my life I'm sharing. But there are so many where I needed God to come through. But what kind of person was I? I never put God, took God at his word. Let the sermon be preached like now. I felt good. I shouted the hallelujahs. But I never got to work. I want you to realize that the only thing that is going to change your life the trajectory of future generations if, is if you get to work. People ask me how I do it, and I tell them I do it the same way you don't do it. The very same way you decide I shall sleep is the way I decide I am not going to sleep. So the way you do it is the way I do it. You have made a decision. You're going to be complacent. You've made it, by the way, without knowing you have decided. You've decided you're the person who must make a line behind the pastor after every service to be prayed for. They will keep praying for you. And nothing is going to help. You have decided that it does not matter what they say about giving. You shall not give. It is a decision. So when I say I am going to listen to the need, for the needs of the people and I am going to give, it is because I have conceptualized the fact that for as far as heaven and earth prevail, seed time and harvest time shall not endure. That, so, 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 sorry, they shall not pass off. I mean, I have decided that every word that is spoken from the mouth of the father has i mean my only question usually is has it come from the mouth of the father that is all i want if it has come from the mouth of the father unisadubango will do it i will do it 
The Bible says train up a child in the way it should grow. It doesn't say cuddle a child in the way it should grow. No. It says T-R-I. T-R-A-I-N. Train. Are we together? So I train. My husband usually tells me that it is okay. Huh? Just a few years from today. The difference between the trained child and the child who grew by free range will show. You know, some children are free range children. People wake up and open the door and the kids go. And the kids come in and the door is closed. You have made that choice. It is a choice. So I made a choice. I want you to take up that last slide. I made a choice and I want you to make a choice to get to work, child of God. Get to work. The Bible tells us, cast your bread upon the waters and after many days you will find it. So everything you are doing with your child now, after many years, you will find it. After many years, my children will be married to women after God's own heart. That is the reason why when I post on Facebook and people say, Eunice, I am your mother-in-law. Oh, I say, no. I, by the way, if you've done it, I never reply on Facebook, but I say, no. And then I declare what I want to see. Because the Bible says that I will decrease something and it will be established. I'm not sure how you're raising that you are called, calling your princess. I'm not sure. Because many of us are quick to say, to call our children, Mr. President, whatever, whatever. But you're raising a God. The way you're raising him, you're not raising princess or king material. Speaking it over and over again is not going to turn that child into it. You must get to work. You must work, people. The Bible tells us that we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. What are you trembling about, child of God? Now, there is a man I love. He's called Joshua. He says in Joshua 24:15. <laughs> and that is the next thing I want you to decide. Fix your pursuit and your focus. Because Joshua told the people, he said, I don't know what you have decided to do. But as for me and my house, we shall do what? I have many people who love me. And I thank you. And I have many people who hate me. Because they say, nah, you need bango, yeah, it touch it. Let me, today let me tell you what I call myself. I call myself a royal priesthood. I call myself God's own possession. A person belonging to God. I was telling one of my daughters, they are selling the books that you see. The Bible says I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. When fugida. Are we together? And, and I, I, I was telling a friend yesterday that when I go, when I do catering and I go for events, many times people shout at us and they say, Temasoma, that's why we cook food. Before the Lord cast his light on the word that I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. I used to react. That is when I would speak all the English I know, eh? so that they know I know English. And then I would make sure everyone knows I'm a doctor and of engineering. But now I know that whether you shake, whether you do what, I am seated in heavenly places. Wembera, it does not matter whether you are calling me what, I am seated with Christ. Where? In heavenly places. And the Bible tells me that we fight against principalities and rulers of the heavenly world. Eh? Places. Meaning that I have overcome the enemy. When I am in spiritual warfare, I'm not down here while the devil is up there. No. Are we together? And that is where I fight from. And those are the things I'm making my children understand. I'm making them understand that they are children of the most high God. It doesn't matter. So you have got to decide what you and your household will do. Joshua said, he told them, choose for yourselves. But as for me, I decided what our scripture in our home, our theme, our vision, our focus, because every family must have one, is Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. 
And I want to read it for you in a certain version. And our children have memorized it. They have to know it because that's who we are. That's our vision. That's who we are. So when you see us taking certain territories, you will understand that we are only doing who we are. It says we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we do good things he planned for us long ago. But I want, us, I want to read it for you in this version. It says we are his workmanship. We are his own masterwork. We are a work of art created in Christ Jesus. We are reborn from above. We are spiritually transformed. We are renewed. We are ready to be used in our home. We are ready to do what? To be used. So our children know that serving in church is a command if you're an adubango. Because we are God's work of art. We are ready to do what? To be used. There is nothing like, who will pray now? I don't want to pray. See, man, we are ready. Our mouths are ready to be used to pray. Our breath is ready to be used to pray. We are ready. Our hands are ready to play those instruments. We are ready to do what? To be used. Because we are Christ's masterpiece. Okay? And then it says... For good works God prepared for us beforehand. We are taking parts which he set so that we would walk in them. We are living, ha, this is my favorite, we are living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. So you must fix your pursuit and your focus. The Samaritan woman fixed her pursuit and her focus. She wanted living water. That was her pursuit. The woman with the issue of blood fixed her pursuit and her focus. But number three, consider the ant. <clears throat> consider the ant. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 to 11 tells us, consider the ant, you lazy man. Consider the ant, you sluggard. The ant has no leader. The Bible says, <laughs> consider the ant, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. And it continues and says, though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work. Meaning they don't have a pastor. They don't have anyone to say, Katisaba, now do this. Now what? Now. They don't even have. They don't. They labor hard all summer gathering food for the winter. Ask your neighbor if they have some food for the winter. And food can be in all ways. Eh? There is spiritual food. There is physical food. All kinds of food. And it's saying, but you lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? The ant has no prayer leader to wake up the ant at three to pray. But the ant wakes up. Are we together? One of the devotionals I did recently actually said that in the environment where the ant lives, there is nothing that is smaller than it. The ant is the smallest. Because even the blades of grass through which it moves are bigger than the ant. But it works diligently. It works without excuse. And it brings forth ant hills. Now, when you study the science of ants, an ant has a, a life, a shelf life, or a life expectancy of 45 to 60 days. But it at least lives an ant hill. Hmm? In the 45 days it lives on earth, it lives an ant hill. What is your life expectancy? Huh? First, first tell us, what's your life expectancy? Like 50? Huh? Have you at least made an ant hill? Like some, something there. It, now, also when you study the science of ants, it tells, they tell you that the ant has only 250,000 brain cells. The human being has millions upon millions of cells. I have told the story before on social media, and I will tell it here for the benefit of those who are not on or who don't follow me. I listened to Pastor Chiganda preaching recently and he talked about the virgin brains. And he said, a white man was asked that, if you died today 
and you were given an opportunity to come back, who would you want to come back as? And he said, Lord, you can leave my body the way it is, but by all means, give me an African brain. And God said, are you sure? An African brain? And the white man said, you see, the African brain is virgin. They've not used it at all. So I want that brain. Because he said, you see, for us, our brains are overworked. We come up with this phone, then we change it into another phone, then our mobile phone, then now let's put cameras on it. So he said, we are dealing with tired brains. If you can only give me that brain, I will be fine. I was so annoyed that day. Pastor Chibrige talked about being angry. I was angry. And the man of God asked, and he said, okay, if you are saying your brain is not virgin, he asked it in Luganda. He said, Go wakolachi. Like, if we look at everything made by, made in, made wa, wakolachi. Because the highest form of brain use is creation. Are we together? Now, the ant will create something. You need to regroup and readjust your strategy. You need to regroup and readjust your strategy. You need to pursue and seek deeper. Luke 5, 4 to 10 is a story of Peter and his friends when they went to fish. They fished all night and caught nothing. Like you have prayed all year and caught nothing. Like you have gone to every meeting all your life and caught nothing. And then Jesus came and he told them to cast the nets deeper. He told them, now go out where it is deeper. Meaning, if you have fished in a certain place for so long, let me tell you, child of God, children of God, launch deeper. Go deeper. I was telling a friend who asked me the other day, he said, Eunice, you said, I have, I have my two girls. One or two of my mentees, I go with her way to pray every week. And she said, but how do you pray the whole day? And I told her, you see, you need to understand prayer. We don't go to pray to tell God things. We go to pray to see. Have you heard that? We go to pray to see. That is why Jesus, when he was performing all those miracles, they used to ask him, Obijawa, and he answered, he said, what I see my father do, I also do. Jesus would be up on the mountain in the night, and he would clearly see what is going to happen in that day. He would know that I will be moving and at Solomon's colonnade, I'm going to find someone who is going to look like this and when that person comes to me, I will just spit and I will touch. He would have seen his father do. We go to pray to do what? To see. So you don't go to pray for your business and you say, oh God, oh God, a financial breakthrough, help me. That you go to ask God. God, what can I do in this business differently? If you are telling me to enlarge my territory, if you are telling me to push my tent pegs, and then he see, shows you, and then you come down the mountain and you get to work. That is how I have done my business. There was a time I wasn't breaking even. And I went in prayer and I said, God, I need to see. Because you were a caterer. You failed multitudes. That's what I do. So show me some skills. How do I multiply this bread? And he told me, tomorrow you have an introduction. I said, yes. He said, now, go with your eyes open. I could show you in anything some details. And so we are there, and the introduction is going on, and people are dancing, and they are bringing gifts, and then this person comes with a whole leg of a cow, and they are walking, and I see them, and I say, Father, I understand, and he said, Eunice, when you go to the butcher, and you say, give me a kilo of beef, 
you will get that kilo of beef at the price of retail. That person who is giving you that kilo of beef must make some money. When you go and you buy a whole leg, you will get it at a wholesale price. But even better, buy a whole cow. And then I started to say, but God, can I afford? And he said, Philippians 4.19, my God has supplied all my needs, yes, and even once, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He said, don't you know that I own cattle upon a thousand hills? I'm talking about things, and I say, yes, Father. I get my beef if I buy a whole leg at the most at 9,000 shillings a kilo. Whether you're getting it at 15K, whether you're getting it at 20, whether you're getting it at 10, because I went to pray and I saw. I will tell you another story. I went to Dubai to shop for Talitha. I have a kitchenware store. So I shop and shop, and for some reason, I remain with about $2,000. I had gone to shop for Talitha. But one of the things I do when I enter a city is I proclaim and I say, open the gates, open the gates, open those doors, all ye gates, that the queen of glory will come in. I say, open the gates. I command that land to receive me. And then I tell my eyes to be open. So I decide to walk around in the market. And then I find this shop, Indian shop. And they are selling rice, they are selling tomato paste, they are selling all these things. And then I say, let me go in. And then I ask, how much is that tomato paste? They tell me the price. I calculate and I realize, hmm, we were, se- we were getting tomato paste in Kampala at that time. The tin, which I think now in the supermarket is 4,000 shillings, they were selling it at wholesale at 3,000 shillings. So I calculate, and after taxes, it doesn't matter how much the URA guy would sabotage me. Well, I knew that I could get it at 2,5. That is what I knew. Are we together? So I decided, let me buy some tomato paste, let me buy soy sauce. I bought supplies for the kitchen. And I said, I will see what will happen. Now listen to this. The tomato paste comes... They tax me. I get it into the kitchen. And when you hear this, don't say hallelujah yet because you'll be shocked. I get it into the kitchen and the final price is 2300 And I'm starting to dance. And the father says, no, stop. I open the can. I open the box. And the can of tomato paste I had got at 2 3 was the huge one that goes for 8000 Did you hear that? I was in shock. I said, what kind of saving is this? Because I thought I'd save that two, three. I mean, it would be a saving, 7,700 shillings per can. When you're in bed, that's a big saving. I had saved, for how much? 6,700 shillings per can of paste. So people used to ask me, how do you sell your food? The kind of food you sell at that price. I sell it with the father like that. At that price. Now, for me, when it comes to God and seeking God, I am like Peter and his friends. And I'll ask for just a few more minutes. Peter and his friends, had, had, they had tried to fish all night. And they had caught nothing. And then the father came and said, cast your nets deeper. And they got a whole bottle of fish. But when the father told them, you can follow me, they did not look at this fish. They said, it shows that there must be more than this. So they said, I can leave this fish here. If he came in one night, And by the sound of one word, he made me catch this much. I will catch a lot more. Now that is the way you should be with the presence of God. You pursue more. When you fast for three days, you don't sit and hang your lurels. You say, if when I fasted for three days, I got this much, there has to be more. So you stretch forth and you go for another seven days. Ladies, are we together? Like eggs. Eh? 
like eggs. Why? Because the Bible says that they are like arrows in my youth. I can cast these boys so, so far. It took me so long to be able to read certain volumes of books. And I see my eight-year-old Ronel reading Think Big. On his birthday last month, we said, what can we buy for you? He said, just give me a watch. I go to Aristok and I will get a book. When Ronald goes, he doesn't go to the children's aisle. Last term, he read two books a week. And I'm not talking about Ladybird. I'm not talking... Chapter books, rich dad, poor dad, what? Those, are, and he is reading. Because he writes reviews, he will tell you what he has understood. I mean, Sam has met my children. I might talk and talk, and you say, I get you. Sam has met my children. He finds and he sees what they read. Why? Because the brain is a muscle. You can exercise it and you can make it do whatever you want it to do. So, some of us settle for fat brains. You're not exercising the brain, so it is full of fat. Even memorizing the scriptures, you say, this is the word of truth, children of God. So, you've got to fix your princess's heart and fix your focus. And leave everything else like Peter and his brethren did and pursue and finally you've got to hone your faith you've got to dust your knees pursuits are made on our knees people there has to be a woman like Rachel crying for her children crying for this nation crying for her marriage there has to be a man that wakes up like Daniel and lifts his hands towards Jerusalem and plants something in the presence of God there has to be that man your family cannot go on without being guided you can't as a Christian you have to be angry at some point you can't be born again for that long and you still have basic questions like I don't know where to invest your father is the chief investor and the, quest, the, the, the investment answers and opportunities are waiting at the throne but you are not seeing you know, intimacy is the same as into me, see. And prayer is about intimacy. You've got to be in a place where you say, I will not let go until I hear. I will not let go until things change. I will not let go until I see my Lord. Ladies, you've got to blaze some trails you've got to break some cycles if you won't do it the heathen will do it last year I found out about my business I was wondering what do I and then someone told me about a businessman in the city that I will not mention who took a whole year a whole year Nagenda a whole year Now you have your tiny business which you pray for when you remember it. And you're competing with that man. I want us to rise up. And I want us to come in the presence of God and say, what are some of the strategies you are going to change? What are some of the parts that you need to change? I didn't tell you a key thing, and I will ask to, to be allowed to say it, because the Spirit of God has brought it to mind. That story of the people by the pool where every once a year an angel would come and stir the water. The Bible says this man had been there for 32 years. I'm a 38-year-old, so I can really... 
understand 32 years. Actually, I was poor <laughs> for 34 years. Now, when you, when you understand the Jerusalem stories and everything, that pool had five porches, and those porches were around. The lame people are there. The blind people are there. You know, misery loves company. Okay? Do you think that every time the angel stirred the water and one man or woman got in first, the friends were happy for them? Your friends and your relatives are not going to be happy when you change the narrative. I have seen it. But for the sake of generations to come, it is well. It is okay. I have refused certain declarations in my house. And even my sisters and my parents know. You can call me a wiseacre, it is well. This morning I was talking to someone who was saying, but how can you pay maid that much, whatever. There is even no work. And I said, okay, so if there is no work, then don't get a maid. But don't be here saying things like that in my hearing. The narrative must change. Tell your neighbor the narrative must change. It has to change. So I want you to get a notebook. I didn't see many notebooks, but I tell all the girls I mentor that God, by the way, God never speaks to you if you're disorganized. Because if you've gone to pray to see, Oganda be wandikawa. Oganda be jukirotia. And so they don't come in any of my meetings without a notebook. Because God wants to entrust you with life. So I want you to write down what are some of the things, the strategies you are going to have to change. Because we are going to bring them to God in prayer. Now. What are some of the cycles that you are going to break? And what are some of the paths you are going to blaze? People, you can be born in Uganda... I usually tell my URA friends every time my goods come. Sometimes they keep my goods for so many months. And one of them knows that I usually tell them that I am going to prosper. And in this generation, with you at that desk. In this what? Is where I'm going to prosper. And it will be with you at that desk. Sabotaging me the way you are doing. So you saw so that you look back and say, Na ye, how did it happen? So that I answer you and say, by the Lord. So I'm not one of those business people who says, Na ye, you are a, Na ye, children of God, we shall prosper by fire, by the anointing in this generation. Because this is our season. And then my children will be for a sign and a wonder in this what? In this generation. Let me hear some people begin to talk to God. Bring the ruins to him. Bring the ashes to him. And say, Lord, the truth is, last year I made a decision to change this, but I didn't. But this time I am believing and I am hoping and I am going to blaze this trail. I have seen bad marriages. I have grown up looking at bad marriages. I made a decision that mine will not be bad. And I work at it. And it is possible, children of God. That is the path I have trailed. My children wake up every morning and they see a man and a woman who love each other deeply. Because it is possible, children of God. We are going to build houses and sleep in them. We are going to take over the riches of the wicked in this generation. We are going to buy land and we are going to build businesses in it. Not just by speaking, but we are going to get to work. Women of God, we are going to get to work in this generation. Oh, Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come afresh on everyone in this place. 
Let there be a fire. Let there be a fresh wind. Let there be an anointing. Lord, when they were in the upper room, tongues of fire came upon them all. Now, Lord, I declare and I call forth tongues of fire in the east, in the west, in the north, all across this room. In the name of Jesus, let there be a man, let there be a woman who will groan in the presence of God. Oh, Jesus, we come to Mount Zion. We come to Mount Zion where things are changed. We are going to serve you. We will not be complacent in this generation. We come against every force of wickedness, every power of evil in the high places, in that place where we rule. May we begin to rule. May we begin to see the goodness of God in this land of the living. Lord, this is for our children. Lord, this is for the generations after us. We are not going to seek you in vain because your word has told us that you have not told your servant Eunice to seek you in vain. You have not told your servant Israel to seek you in vain. The time that we are here in your presence is going to count. Rock of ages, we come that you will clap for us. Children filled with the Holy Spirit. Our children are filled with the Holy Spirit. Those in the womb, those that are born in the name of Jesus. Oh God, oh Holy Ghost fire. There is nothing that you cannot do. We are not here to joke. Lord, we are here to search and to seek you. You say that those who seek you with all of their heart, that they will find you. Man, Lord, we hold on to the altar and we refuse to let go. Lord, we are like Jabez. He said, expand my territory. He said that you will bless me. He said that you will not harm me. We are the heads and we are not the tails. Oh, Makasita, Yaravakasete, Bokosita.